Welcome to worship at Wild Rose United Church, where we seek to embody the beloved community of Jesus through radical welcoming, uh, progressive theology, and social justice. No matter if you grew up in the United Church of Canada or had never attended any church before this morning, you are welcome and it's good that you're here. No matter if you come full of optimism and joy or burdened by shame or grief or fear or anger, there is a place here for you. No matter if you come seeking answers or only wish to better understand the questions, all God's children of every color of the rainbow are embraced as sacred, treasured, and made in the image of God. My name is Murray Spear. My personal pronouns are he and him, and I'm privileged to be the minister here at Wild Rose United Church. With me in the sanctuary providing leadership are Dan Somerville and Diane McKenzie, Karen Nell Bennett, Linda Ellis, Hazel Buchanan, uh, Don McIntosh, Corinne Salajano, and Bill Aiken. Wherever you are, however you're accessing this service, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, I hope uh, you'll do us a favor. If you're able, go to the chat or comment section. Let us know who you are and that you're watching, uh, and that will leave us a meaningful record as well as a very useful one. Long before anyone who looked like me uh, came to this continent from Europe or to this place where the bow and the elbow meet, called Mokinstis in Blackfoot and Calgary in English, there were people here. People who had been here from the beginning and who had fully developed systems of politics and economics and spirituality and culture. We acknowledge this history and we acknowledge our neighbors in the Treaty 7 First Nations. Uh, the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, Kanai, and Tikani First Nations and also the Sutina First Nation and the three nations of the Stony Nakoda, Wesley, Bearspaw, and Chiniki, and also Métis Nation of Alberta. We all have work to do in healing and reconciling the broken relationships of centuries. Reminder about the annual meeting coming on February the 27th. Uh, information will be coming out very soon about how to uh, join that meeting and attend on Zoom. And uh, if you uh, know of anyone uh, who may be uh, um, uh, may want to be in attendance at that meeting, who won't be get, who won't necessarily be hearing these announcements, um, please do reach out to them and reach out to us and uh, share that contact information when it comes out. Now, as we prepare ourselves for worship, Karen will lead us in our opening song, and while that's happening, Linda Ellis will light our Christ candle. Please join me in the call to worship. Your responses are in yellow. Righteous is your instruction, O Holy One. Return to your people with mercy as is right. Rivers of tears stream from my eyes. Reliance on you is the way of understanding. Redeem me from all that oppresses and threatens. Remind the people of your words of salvation. Amen. So you may have noticed that every line in that call to worship started with the letter R. That's because uh, Psalm 119 is, uh, it's one of the longest, or the longest psalm. It's 176 verses. And the reason it's 176 verses is because it's 22 sets of eight verses that start with um, succeeding letters of the Hebrew alphabet, or the alphabet, as it's also known. Um, and so I believe, it's very difficult, it's not easy to do, but I believe that when we use that, that, uh, psalm, we should be trying to retain the acrostic uh, structure where each section of eight verses starts with the same letter. As we gather together for worship, we bring all of ourselves, including our hurting or prideful hearts, our shames and griefs, our fears and hopes, 
Let us bring our whole selves in openness and trust to the one who is always ready to listen in an opening prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, I do not understand your ways. Sometimes the things you call me to do seem foolish to me. Sometimes I fall into the familiar pattern of revenge, getting ahead, or settling for the lowest common denominator. I do not love others the way you have loved me, and I wish to do better. I seek your help. Remind me that you do not ask me to be perfect, but only to move faithfully in the direction of your call. Help me to see you out there moving in the world and in here moving in me. Send your Christ into my life and transform me to your purposes. Lift me from my settled life and send me to do your work wherever I may be. Peace Candle is a tradition that has spread from congregation to congregation since the mid-1980s, and now it has come to us here. Peace is characterized not by the absence of conflict, but by the presence of justice. Peace is the state that emerges in our midst when those who have much do not have too much, and those who have little do not have too little. When the very old and the very young feel supported and secure, parents can feed their children and themselves, and all have the opportunity for meaningful work in their community. As I light this candle, let us commit ourselves to pray and work for that kind of peace. And now Dan and Karen will lead us in the hymn.
I wonder if you know what, I'm, uh, what picture I'm holding right here. Folks in the sanctuary, do you recognize this picture? I have to hold it up in the air so Karen can see it. It's the United Church Crest. And I thought, I've been here for a while and we haven't talked about the crest. So I thought I would point out the details because it's something that we should know about. Now, some of this has been on our crest since we started as a church. But some of it has been added over the years. The parts that have been there from the beginning are the shape, which is, uh, even though it doesn't have a tail, it's a fish shape. And a fish is one of the early symbols uh, of the church and of Jesus um, because of the stories about Jesus um, feeding people with fish and also because uh, the word fish in Greek, the first letter, the uh, the first letters of the phrase Jesus Christ, son, God's Son, Savior, spell out the word fish in Greek. Inside the, uh, the fish shape is a red X. That's been there from the beginning. And that is both uh, the cross, the Christian cross, but it's also the first letter in the word Christ in Greek is the X shape. It's called uh, ki or chi. Other parts that have been there from the beginning are the four symbols on the inside. The burning bush from Exodus 3 as a symbol of uh, God speaking to us. God spoke to Moses in the form of a bush that was on fire but wasn't consumed by the fire. And that symbol uh, was chosen by our Presbyterian um, ancestors when they joined the United Church. On the other side is an open Bible, um, and that symbol was chosen by the Congregationalists uh, when they joined the United Church. And on the top is uh, the descending dove, the dove of, uh, that symbolizes peace and symbolizes God's promise also to Noah after the flood. And that was chosen by our Methodist uh, ancestors. And on the bottom is two more Greek letters, Alpha and Omega, and uh, those are from the book of Revelation, and they symbolize uh, God's all-encompassing um, uh, will and love for us. Other things that have been there from the beginning are the maple leaves. There are four of them. I don't think there were four of them to begin with. I think there were fewer of them, but now there are four, and they're quite small, but you can see them there. They're red, the four of them. And also the name, the United Church of Canada, that was uh, there from the beginning. Um, and it's uh, uh, the church union, how the United Church of Canada was formed. It started uh, um, back in the 1800s with uh, when so many new people were coming to Canada, to the cities, none of the churches were big enough or resourceful enough to look after all of the new people coming to the cities, so we had to work together. And that's, uh, that's how that uh, all got started back in the 1800s. And also these Latin words that are down here, the Latin words say, um, ut omnes unum sint, and that means uh, so that all may be one, all may become one, and that's from the book of John in our Bible. Um, and so it's a, um, uh, a theme of, of coming together and joining together. But there's more pieces that have been added since the beginning. One of them is the French name of our church, L'Église Unie du Canada. Uh, L'Église means church, Unie means united, uh, and du Canada means of Canada. And, um, and that was added because even though the Presbyterians, Methodists, and Congregationalists were British uh, forms of church, uh, there are many Francophone, uh, French-speaking congregations in the United Church of Canada. So it's important to include them. And then the most recent changes are the four colors in the background of these four sections. 
And those were added because when the United Church of Canada was formed in 1925, there were at least 60 indigenous communities, uh, indigenous Canadian communities, that were part of the United Church. But because they were considered missions instead of congregations, they weren't included in any of the conversations around church union. They weren't included in any of the decisions about the crest. And so, uh, several decades later, in the uh, around, I think it was around 2011, uh, they were finally consulted and included in the decisions about the crest. Which brings us to the last part of the crest, which are the words down here. They're the words in, in Mohawk, uh, the Mohawk language, Agwe nia dedewa ne ren. Agwe nia dedewa ne ren. And they mean all my relations in the Mohawk language. Mohawk was chosen because it's believed that they were the first in North America uh, to be visited by a Methodist missionary. Um, and Agwe Nia Dedewa Neiren means all my relations. And in, the, uh, in indigenous theology, the sentiment, all my relations, is uh, very consistent with ut omnes unum sint in Latin, but it adds some more depth because all my relations is not only about people. All my relations is about forests and animals and rivers and stones and oceans and the sky and the clouds and the sun and the moon all my relations. So those are all the parts of the crest. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that when we talked about changing the crest in around 2011, whenever that happened, that we decided to keep what was there and just to add more and just to include more, more symbols, more people, uh, more meaning, more depth. Thank you so much for listening today. I believe uh, we're going to have a recording from our choir.
The scripture reading today is from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 4 through 15. The king went to the great shine at Gibeon in order to sacrifice there. The king's, usually off, the king's usual offering on that altar was a thousand entirely burned offerings. The Holy One appeared to Solomon at Gibeon in a dream that night. God asked, Whatever you wish, or sorry, ask whatever you wish, and I'll give it to you. Solomon responded, You showed so much kindness to your servant, my father David, who walked before you in truth, righteousness, and with a heart true to you. You've kept this great loyalty and kindness and have now given David a child to sit on the royal throne. And now, my holy God, you have made me your servant king in my father David's place, but I'm young and inexperienced. I know next to nothing, but I'm here, your servant, in the middle of the people you have chosen, a large population that can't be numbered or counted due to its vast size. Please give your servant a discerning mind in order to govern your people and to distinguish good from evil because no one is able to govern this important people of yours without your help. It pleased the Holy One that Solomon had made this request. God said, because you asked for this instead of requesting long life, wealth, or victory over your enemies, um, asking for discernment so as to acquire good judgment, I will now do just what you've said. Look. I hereby give you a wise and understanding mind. There has been no one like you before now, nor will there be anyone like you afterward. I now also give you what you didn't ask for, wealth and fame. There won't be a king like you as long as you live. And if you walk in my ways and obey my laws and commands, just as your father David did, then I will give you a very long life. Solomon awoke and realized it was a dream. The king went to Jerusalem and stood before the chest containing the tablets of the Holy Covenant. Then the king offered entirely burnt offerings and well-being sacrifices and held a celebration for all the royal servants. God offers us words of life. The living word, amen. The stories we tell have the power to shape the world around us. Just as the words we use have the power to shape our perceptions. There's fascinating research about how if we don't have a word for a thing, we can be unable to see it. The example of this that comes most readily to me is when I, I traveled in, a, in, the, in, a, um, in Latin America, in the Spanish-speaking part of the world, where uh, with someone, with a companion, who was allergic to limes, but not to lemons. In Spanish, does anyone here speak Spanish here in the sanctuary? Hazel Hazel does? What's Spanish for lime, Hazel, do you know? Limon. Limon. What's Spanish for lemon, do you know? (laughs) The word limon is both. So if you really wanted to distinguish, you might have to say uh, uh, green, green lime and yellow lime. But to travel with someone who's allergic to limes and not to lemons, 
We didn't know that in that particular part of the world, in the native language of almost everyone there, they didn't have a word for the difference. There's other examples. There's some very compelling uh, arguments that suggest that there was a moment in the development of human culture, Western culture at least, where we discovered the color blue. And that before that, because we didn't have a word for it, we couldn't perceive it. Which is why in uh, the works of the Greek uh, epic poet Homer, the ocean is not described as being blue, it's described as being wine dark. And the people who put this together found that uh, references to blue sky have a starting point. And it makes some sense because except for uh, a rare mutation in human eyes and uh, so certain flowers, the color blue is extremely rare. But it's not only words that shape our perceptions. Stories also shape our reality in the same way. The story of the first chapters of the book of Genesis as we are accustomed to reading them, as we are, as are ingra is ingrained in our understanding as uh, Anglophone Westerners, is that human beings are given um, authority to dominate the earth. But in another story, if we chose to tell a different story, perhaps human beings would be given responsibility for the earth instead of authority. Perhaps we may even be given responsibility not to care for the earth, but simply to live in it peacefully and respectfully. which is a story that we tell every time we recite uh, the creed of the United Church of Canada, that rather than dominating the natural world, we live with respect in the natural world. And so we must be careful. Because we have a tendency, I believe uh, it, 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 it must come from, uh, it must hold some evolutionary advantage uh, for us. We have a tendency when a story comes past us, a news story, for example, that is consistent with our existing assumptions and perspectives. We tend to take it at face value. And sometimes we get tricked by satirical news stories, news stories that are, uh, that are, 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 uh, are not true at all, but are meant as comedy, but we, because they are consistent with our existing understandings, prejudices, 
I remember one that I fell for recently. Thankfully, I, I caught it uh, before I had spread it too far, but it was, it's a particularly funny one and low stakes, so I'm comfortable sharing it with you. It's about the actor Chris Pratt, the Hollywood actor Chris Pratt. And the news came out that he had been cast to play Super Mario. And uh, the news story was that in the responses, in, in the responses to him being cast to play Super Mario, he said, first of all, he said, I won't be doing an Italian accent, I'll be doing my normal accent. And then the news story said that he said, because Mario isn't Italian anymore, he's normal now. And I fell for it. Because it seemed to me that that is something that might slip out of his mouth without him thinking all the way through what the implications were. But it was made up. It was false. But we tend to dig deeper into stories that are inconsistent with our existing perspectives understandings, and when they confirm our existing perspectives and understandings, we take them at face value. It's something wired into us that we have to teach ourselves not to do this. We're talking this month about uh, the books of Kings. In our, in our Christian Old Testament, it's split into two. Uh, historically, it was split into two because it was just too long to fit on one roll of, uh, of um, papyrus. Uh, papyrus could only sustainably be a certain length to be rolled up into a scroll. And, uh, and so uh, longer books would be split into two. It really is just one work. It chronicles the time period between the death of King David, uh, roughly around um, 950 uh, BCE. If anyone here wants to look that up and, and, and see uh, what the actual date is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, between the death of King David and the destruction of Jerusalem uh, about uh, 300, 400 years later. It chronicles the split following the reign of King Solomon between uh, the northern tribes of Israel and the southern tribes. The northern kingdom becomes known as Israel, kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom becomes known as Judah. Jerusalem is the capital of Judah. The capital of the northern kingdom moves around. And following the death of Solomon, they are separate and they remain separate. The northern kingdom uh, falls to the, uh, I don't remember which, uh, I, I don't think it's the Neo-Babylonian, I don't think it's the Babylonian Empire, I think it's the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Uh, in the 7th century, Jerusalem falls to the Babylonian Empire in the 6th century, and Judah. But for that time, they have kings of their own. So for the rest of this month, we'll be talking about some of those kings. And we'll be talking about the prophets who speak to the people on behalf of God and who speak to the king on behalf of God and the people. But before we get to that, we have Solomon. 
Solomon is depicted in the book of Kings as one of the greatest monarchs of the ancient world. He is the one who builds the temple in Jerusalem that stands until it is destroyed by Babylon. And the descriptions of his temple are lengthy and elaborate and um, extravagant with the amount of gold and fine cedar and uh, uh, stonework. But these stories, we know when they're written. They aren't written when Solomon was king. Because the book of Kings ends with the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of Solomon's temple at the hands of the Babylonian Empire. So surely there are memories contained within it, possibly even literary sources that existed prior to the book of Kings that are incorporated into it. In fact, it references repeatedly throughout it the book of the deeds of the kings of uh, Judah and the book of the deeds of the kings of Israel. Literary sources that pre-existed, that no longer exist. But Kings itself is written with full knowledge of what happens to Solomon's temple in the end. Of what happens to Solomon's dynasty in the end. It seems reasonable that Solomon was, in fact, the wealthiest king of the ancient Hebrews. It seems reasonable that he was, in fact, the most militarily secure of the ancient kings of the Hebrews. His reign coincides with a time of uh, disorder and weakness in both uh, the Egyptian empire to the south and the uh, uh, whatever geographical power existed uh, to the north. The other empires of the time were not a serious threat, and so Solomon was able to expand, to breathe, to build culture, to build wealth. But the extravagance of the description of the temple, the details about how much wood was sent from Lebanon, how much gold was gathered from surrounding nations. There's no record of that in any other ancient culture. The amount of wood that the Book of Kings claims Solomon received from Lebanon is not remembered in Lebanon. Solomon, the wealthiest king of the ancient world, as he's described in the book of Kings, is not remembered as the wealthiest king in ancient history in any other nation. So we're left to ask ourselves, if this story If this story written down 
in the time of destruction and failure and fear and uncertainty is not meant to construct the past, but is meant to, in fact, as stories do, construct a present reality and a future reality. Then where are we left? Solomon asks God for wisdom and a discerning mind. God grants that wish. Grants that Solomon will also be wealthy, successful, long-lived, grants also that Solomon's descendants will form a dynasty. But Solomon, in all his wisdom, if we read on in his story, allows his wives from other ethnicities to continue their forms of worship. And for this, God says, peace shall never again be known in your house. The point of the story is not that Solomon is a wise king or a good king or a mighty king or a rich king. The point of the story is that the wisest, most powerful, wealthiest, most popular king in the history of the Hebrew people failed. Was not perfect. Could not, in fact, achieve This vision, a vision that runs through this section of our Old Testament, starting with uh, the book of Deuteronomy and continuing to the end of the book of Kings, a vision of purity and perfection and ideal worship. That the idea, the very idea of perfection and purity is not even achievable by the most gifted ruler imaginable. The stories we tell shape our reality. Last week, uh, last Sunday, we celebrated uh, Holocaust uh, Memorial Week. Uh, and on the week of the Holocaust Memorial, you may have seen this in the news, uh, a book was removed from school libraries in a certain uh, county or a certain state in the United States. I don't remember if it was, if it was at a county level or at a state level. It's a book that uh, I couldn't bring with me today because it's been packed up for a few years, but I have it. It's called Mouse. It's a graphic novel, uh, 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 a, cart uh, uh, 
cartoon format graphic novel. Written by a New York cartoonist, a Jewish New York cartoonist, based on the stories of his, and now I'm going to reveal that I, 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 I didn't retain the details, it, 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 his father or grandfather, of the experience of the Holocaust, starting in Poland and ending in Germany, as Pol a Polish Jew. subject to the Holocaust. And it's being removed from schools, arguably because it depicts violence, arguably because it has some uh, impolite words. But the greater context is this understanding that we have, that the stories we tell are able to shape our reality. And Mouse is a story that depicts the Jewish people in the Holocaust as victims and the uh, pardon me, depicts visually the Jewish people as mice and depicts visually the ethnically German people as cats. And in the scenes in Poland, the ethnically Polish people are, uh, are pigs. Um, not, not as a... Uh, not as a strong symbol, but as a symbol of uh, the opposite of Judaism, but also not a predator uh, like the cats. And a deeper analysis of the decision to pull this story from the shelves when other stories of the Holocaust remain, and other stories that depict violence remain, and other stories that use the same words that might be objectionable remain. Is that first of all this is a story with no savior. Think of other stories of the Holocaust that you're aware of. Schindler's List. White Christian Savior. The Diary of Anne Frank. Well, eventually they were found, but that was not the fault of the person who was protecting them, who was a white Christian Savior. Mouse has clear-cut categories. Germans were cats. Jews were mice. Mouse has no savior. White Christian or otherwise. It is simply a story of survival in a hostile world. And now, this week, we're in Black History Month. In a year when school boards, not only in the United States, but in a year when, when, uh, when our government in Alberta is changing, trying to change our curriculum, want schools to teach children stories of the past in which there are no villains.
in which. Slavery. The exploitation of uh, an entire continent by another in order to build the society that we live in in Canada and the United States is portrayed as morally neutral. And right now, in Canada, we have stories being told about convoys and blockades. And the stories that we tell have the ability to shape our reality. Hero and villain. King and prophet. Cat and mouse. Trucker and savior. And just like Solomon himself, the story of this time will be written in the future. Right now we are telling the stories of our past. Whether the atrocities committed here in Canada in the name of empire were necessary, excusable, or whether it is time to tell a different story. A story of survival. Survival of people, uh, people of black and, and African heritage who were brought to Canada as slaves and survived. Stories of Indigenous people in Canada who signed treaties thinking that they were uh, agreeing to protection and to share the land. Only then to be forced under threat of violence and sometimes actual violence into the reserve system and the residential school system and the uh, social welfare system and survived. Solomon creates a dynasty that rules for centuries. But no one ever quite matches up to him. And even he fails. And that failure is compounded and compounded and compounded until the homeland is destroyed, the temple is destroyed, the capital city is destroyed and the people are carried off to live in the city of Babylon, but they survive. It 
it's time for us to tell stories. Not about Canada versus the indigenous peoples, but about how the story of the survival of the indigenous peoples against attempts to destroy them is a Canadian story. It's time to tell stories about black history where instead of the story being about whether slavery was useful or necessary or uh, um, justifiable, forget about that and tell stories about how the survival of black people and African heritage in Canada and the United States is a Canadian story. It's time to keep telling stories about how the Holocaust was not a question of whether white Western Christian saviors would be able to rescue the Jews. Either through war or through uh, um, uh, uh, channels to, to get them out of uh, that territory. But stories... of how the survival of the Jewish people and the Jewish culture is a Canadian story. And maybe, if we do it right, if we tell the stories to each other the best way we know how, Listen to the people who are telling us the story of their survival and not turn that story into a story about heroes and villains and great leaders and rescuers and saviors, but listen to the words of survival. like the book of Kings that knows how it's all going to end. Maybe the people who tell our stories in years to come will be able to tell stories about people who weren't perfect, who weren't pure, who weren't able to get it all right, but who were able who were able to let go of the desire to be a hero or let go the desire to cast another as a villain or let go the desire to be a savior or to find a savior in the midst of just mess. And we'll be able to tell a story about how we were able to come together with all those who have also survived 
and tell stories that shape a reality that just maybe God might approve. May it be so. Dan and Karen are going to lead us in another hymn. of the people this morning are in uh, recognition of Black History Month. When we pray together in community, the concerns of each of us are shared by all of us. If you would like to be part of our uh, email uh, concerns, you can let the office know and we will sign you up for that. Uh, and if you have a prayer concern to share, please do let us know at, uh, at pastoralcare at wildroseunited.ca. Let us pray. Spirit of abundance, God of grace, mother of hope, we come before you as people who have all, somewhere along the line, been victims of earthly greed and violence. We have been fooled into thinking that one person can be innately superior to another, that one person can deserve to own another, that a person's skin can determine their destiny. Grant us wisdom and clarity to enter and maintain relationships with those who look and act different. Help us to realize that black history is human history, that the only thing separating us from one another is human belief and human behavior. May the day come when black histories are so wildly taught that no month need be devoted. May we come to see a day when the prison system becomes redemptive for all. A day when the criminal justice system becomes focused on crime and not on controlling black and brown bodies. A day where schools are so well funded that none are excluded by birth or circumstance. We raise up before you today all who are even now sold into slavery around the world and those who await the return of vanished children, parents, and spouses. We raise up before you those who are exhausted from war, famine, and sexual violence established and encouraged by colonial and imperial power. Remind us that colonial empires are not a thing of the past, but a living presence in our politics, our economics, and our religions. May all who are suffering come to know you as the one who is waiting to renew their strength, unshackle their burdens, and raise them up with a rich heritage. May all who are afraid of losing power as cultures shift around us be given hope that they also will be cared for as a child made in your image. At this time, we remember before you in silence all those people and places whose trials and celebrations are burdening and encouraging us today. We pray in silence.
we are most human when we see the humanity in others. Widen our vision so that our love embraces all whom you love. Amen. We gather these and all our prayers, thankful that we may turn to you as to a grandmother who watches over us and pray together as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now on the screen and also available on the website are all of the ways that we can contribute to the ongoing uh, ministries of Wild Rose United Church. All of our offerings further the renewing and reconciling work of God and the church, which we are called to join. As we contemplate our offering, uh, Dan has an offering of music for us. pray. God of light, we offer the fruits of our labor and of your bounty with joyful hearts. We commit our best so that the church may offer witness to your grace and work to the benefit of the last and least. Help us to be faithful stewards of all your gifts and to walk faithfully in the light of your word. Amen. And now I invite you to join in the words of the commissioning and the portions printed in yellow. We are called to shed God's love in the world. Let us carry a spirit of compassion with us. We are called to preach the gospel using words if necessary. May our actions speak louder than words. May Christ journey with you as you go. Let us travel together with joy and hope. Amen. Now may the God of peace equip you with all good things as you follow the call and lead you on your holy path through Jesus Christ, to whom is everlasting glory, as together we go forth.